Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. He is Sean Fitz recording here in Happy Valley where we are on the verge of getting back into Beaver Stadium. The blue-white game returns really the first time that we're going to see these full-on festivities since 2019. And that's a beautiful thing. The weather's looking pretty nice for Saturday. So a lot of good things cooking. Not going to be a full game format. We'll get into some of those details in a moment. But Sean, we've gotten our chance to watch a little bit of practice every Wednesday I'm excited to get out there and watch a full, albeit glorified practice, but a full practice where guys are going to be hitting each other a little bit here and there and, you know, get a chance to really assess some of the different corners of this roster. I I don't know how you can say the weather is going to be good because we're in our third different season this week uh, today with the rain coming down. It's supposed to be 80 on Sunday, so I don't know what's going on in this region, but here we are. Uh, But I can fully agree with you on the second part, which is football is coming to Happy Valley. Slightly modified football. going to be a lot of thud. You know, the the stuff where they don't actually tackle, bring guys to the ground. James Franklin said uh, last night, I thought it was interesting that there was a, there, there are guys that are cleared for thud. So not, not full speed, not full tackling or anything like that, but they can't do the actual scrimmage work. So that's going to cut in, but we did see practice last night. Uh, Penn state had, almost a two deep or we'll give them maybe we'll give them a two deep on the offensive line so that's a step forward um but you know i think there'll be guys that they give a light load to whether that's injury related whether that's just uh you know wear and tear type things um but it's going to be probably a lot like we saw last year not a true spring game but a a, but but a glorified practice with some scrimmaging at the end but that's really what it's all about just to get in and, and, and see some things whet the appetite for the fall season yeah, we'll we'll be watching from the press box, and it'll give us a chance to hopefully see a, a fair, fairly decent amount of offensive linemen. I mean, things are at least trending in the right direction going into this weekend from what we saw on Wednesday. I think it was the first time there were enough bodies out there in uniform to fill out a two deep. And, and you know, we'll see what that looks like. Um, I, I'm really curious to, to see if we can get some extended action with Landon Tangwall working against some defensive linemen. He's a guy that we didn't really get to see last year when they had some spring scrimmage work. And you know, obviously, you know how it goes when, when we get in the practice field during the season, we don't see much. So he's someone I would love to see some extended work from Olu Fashano. You, you talked about him earlier this week when we were spotlighting five guys a piece to watch on the offensive side of the football. You know, James Franklin ventured down the road a little bit with us on the offensive line yesterday night, talking about uh, how Caden Wallace at right tackle, Olu Fashano at left tackle, Juice Scruggs at center. He didn't call anybody a starter because he doesn't want to do that right now. He wants everyone competing, but they're starters. uh, Read between the lines there, what have you. And he didn't want to go that far with Landon Tengwall, who was penciled in at least at that left guard spot. But Tengwall missed some time. We talked about his absence on the the practice field a little bit earlier this month. So you understand that, that those three guys, Fashanu, Wallace, Scruggs, apparently available every practice getting loaded up with reps, uh, but there's open competition. And, and Salim Wormley on the other side, uh, talk about a guy we haven't seen much of. You know, there's a chance there to, to get some assessment because from what we've heard about this defensive front, they're going to be tangling with some si- significant defenders up there. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't really expect too much from the offensive line on Saturday. I think we've kind of laid that out. Uh, nice and clean for you uh, all spring long. But yeah, it'll be nice to see those guys get out there, especially Wormley, who, you know, as we've said before, he, I mean, he got a lot of reps. This, he probably got more reps this spring than I expected. Um, but at the same time, who else was going to get him? I think is kind of what James Franklin's point was. Landon Tangwa missed a couple of weeks. Um, you know, in and out guys have been in and out. Nick Dawkins and JB Nelson were back in pads last night. We didn't see him last week. So there, I mean, it's just been in and out, except for those three guys that you mentioned uh, in Fashanu, Scruggs and Caden Wallace really going to have to be the keystone, you know, that, that you build around. They're going to have to find what they're ne- what they need to do at guard. Uh, Hunter Norzad's going to be here May 15th to take in the first summer session. So he's got to get up to speed quickly. Going to see where, a, you know, a hopefully fully healthy Salim Wormley is. Uh, then Landon Tangwall. So the numbers starting to look better. It's never going to look great. And I think this is the time of year all around college football where you look around and you find yourself shorthanded at a spot like the offensive line. Um, but if you can get yourself where you've got seven, maybe eight guys ready to go. And of course, Bryce Hafner is slated to come back as well. He's played quite a bit of football as a reserve guy in the last couple of years. You you find that that third interior or that fourth interior player, you find that third tackle Will that be, you know, Landon Tengwell is the third tackle, and then you move guys around, you bring in a different guard, you bring in Wormley, you bring in Norzad, whatever it may be. You have a chance to find a solid seven or eight, but that's still, I think, a long way off. 
something I didn't realize until yesterday, talking with Caden Wallace, he and Salim Wormley came in together, same recruiting class, but they are roommates and they have been for the last couple of years. And we're talking about trying to build chemistry and trying to find some cohesion. That helps. That gives you some kind of an edge on the field, off the field, on that right side. I thought that was just a little bit of a notable nugget as you try to kind of sort through that right guard spot, see what that looks like moving forward. Um, as you said, this is going to be a different structure. Uh, lightning light, lightens the load on the offensive line. It may open the door for some more special teams work of course they've got a new coordinator there with Stacey Collins there's competitions that keep positions there um but uh, we're not sure what this we morning. want to see it's more special teams work <laughs> that's been our every Wednesday <laughs> night we've got uh, ample special teams notes going up so check those yes <laughs> and ball security um work there you know not sure what the scoring system will be. Franklin says the goal is to, to not overcomplicate that. Um, and look, this, like you said, glorified practice, that'll be a little bit more apparent, but it's a chance to, for a lot of these guys, first time to get out in front of a Beaver Stadium crowd and be running around the field a bit. Um, and and for us, I mean, it's a chance to, to match some skill sets to the names and kind of shake off what we saw in the high school film and try to apply it to what we see and some of these freshmen sharing the field with Big Ten football players. So I'm excited to see how a guy like Caden Saunders and Omari Evans look out there against what we consider to be a very impressive arsenal of defensive backs for Penn State. And I'm, I'm really curious to see what J.B. Nelson making that jump from Lackawanna College and kind of an abbreviated career there. How does he handle himself? Is he taking reps at a couple different positions? So there'll be plenty to look for. And, and the helpful part is it's on uh, Big Ten Network. So we'll get a chance to review it a little bit more further uh, at, at this spring, which is a nice advantage. Yeah, we can't wait to see that. Uh, the, at least look at the replay and everything like that. Um, but no, I mean it's it, it's a important practice because it's one of fifteen. You know, you don't get too many of these uh, all around uh, the. You know, in in the off season, it's probably more important for the fans than it is for the staff and things like this. The staff will get taped. The staff will be able to review some things and watch how these guys do in the scrimmage situation. But it's it's more about the atmosphere, about the, you know, the, the party coming together and all that kind of stuff. And that bleeds over into recruiting. And that's become such a huge recruiting weekend for the, for Penn state. You look at maybe not the last two years because you can't, you could not host recruits, but the last couple of cycles before that, I mean, you look at the spring game, the lash bash, the whiteout, kind of the, the trifecta of the, our, our the, the, the majority of our class visited for one, two, or possibly all three of these. So you kind of get a, an idea of how you build, and then you build with the, the guys that are coming through. A lot of signees coming this weekend. A lot of the, or most of the uh, 2023 class that's committed is coming this weekend as well. Um, Norzat will be down, Cooper Cousins in 2024. So you get a chance to build that bond and move forward, but you're also putting your, your, you know, your best foot forward for those recruits. One official visit so far this weekend, it's going to be Damian Robinson, who is already committed as well um, from the transfer portal. But uh, you'll have a chance to bring some guys from out of town. You'll have a chance to to get your Pennsylvania guys back on campus and and really just kind of uh, set yourself up for official visit season. Sean, you had a list up on, on Wednesday night um, uh, with uh, the anticipated visitors. I think just the offered guys. It's, it's a pretty impressive bunch. Um, we talk about them in a second, but the commits and the signees that are going to be on campus, and, and there are quite a few. Um, to me, that's a big deal because the coaches are pretty busy on Saturday, and, and the staff is going to have their hands full trying to juggle all the visitors. Um, Franklin mentioned this. They've done a really good job, it feels, this spring getting guys up midweek, getting guys up for some of those Saturday practices and where you can be more of an individual, personal experience, kind of have those one-on-one -on -one settings with, with members of your staff. This is more of a scramble. So I think to have a big turnout from the peer recruiting standpoint, I think that's important. And it gives the guys a chance, like the Alex Birchmeyers of the world, to start to really flex their muscles and, and try to build this class and take ownership. And Saturday is really a, a good opportunity, I think, for them to take that and run with it. Well, you look at the the social world and these guys know each other before even meeting each other. Some of these guys from the Instagram, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. And you you have a chance for those guys to finally meet, uh, feel out personalities and kind of uh, figure out if they feel like the guys around them are the guys that they want to spend the next four years with. So, I mean, you, you've got a guy like Tony Rojas, who's been up a bunch, um, you know, that, that has been, I mean, Penn State's commits have been all over him. He's a top target for Penn State, uh, maybe the top linebacker target for Penn State. Um, and you just got to get him as comfortable as possible to set up for the next part of his recruitment. I think he's going to come out with a top four on Sunday. All indications are that Penn State will, you know, be in it and should be in it. Um, but this is a situation where you're setting yourself up going into the summer 
Um, and then you've got guys coming from from all over the place, a bunch of Florida guys coming up. Uh, Andrew and Michael Harris, uh, the twin four star linebackers from uh, from Florida, going to come up and check some things out. Um, had a story up on Zechariah Owens, who's just absolutely massive from Georgia. Uh, there's going to be a lot of beef in town from Georgia this weekend. Um, 6'6", 345 is Owens. He's a top 100 player. But I, I will say this, the, the list in 23, maybe a little light. The list in 24 really really good uh we talked about quentin martin before you wrote that up a couple of weeks ago the the, the star athlete from belvern in pennsylvania he'll be up chris jones the uh, linebacker from mountain view in stafford virginia uh which is uh, uh deshaun hamilton's old school peter jones from malvern prep uh you know this guy you can go down the list uh, very familiar names if you if you're a familiar name in the 2024 class by now um, that means that you've probably been to campus quite a bit. Anthony Specka from F Pittsburgh Central Catholic fits into that mix as well. So looking at the underclassmen, um, while it may not be as splashy and, and maybe the, the layperson may not know as many of the targets, I, I think that's where the, the meat is in this visitor list. And I just think it's, I mean, you think about some of these rising juniors, rising sophomores, guys that maybe haven't established themselves as major power five prospects are, are, are in communication with Penn State or getting interest, but not at that offer level yet. If they uh, uh, graduate to the offer kind of level, they'll have this experience in their back pocket. The, the last couple of cycles, even the local guys, if they came up in the spring, they were kind of driving through with a self-guided tour situation. So I think to be able to get them situated in Beaver Stadium 60, 70,000 people, whatever that number is going to be, and kind of feel those vibes, that's going to set you up and, and, and help you in a way that, that you were just missing some of that juice, I think, earlier on. And I think but particularly you get some of these young regional guys, again, maybe not necessarily on Penn State's radar fully. They had this experience and they had that trip home where they're raving about it with mom and dad or whoever else is in the car. That can be something that lingers with them two years down the line when they are someone that you're targeting and pursuing. Absolutely. I mean, like you said, these these uh, guys keep popping up. I mean, you look back to 2019, you've got Theo Johnson on that list, Caleb and, and Kobe King on that list. Kobe King didn't even have an offer at that point. Um, and, and you could go even a little bit further. I mean, Vanover was there. Um, so you've got guys that were uncommitted at that point, in addition to the guys that were already committed, which you know makes up usually a, a big chunk of that, that, that offer list. Um, yeah, you've got a lot of building to here and, and that's kind of where you find yourself uh, heading out of the spring. So it, it'll be, um, you know, hopefully the weather's good. It's, it's always a situation where you've got, uh, guys that maybe want to end it or something like that, or maybe have been building to end it. Um, we'll look into that a little bit closer, uh, here at the end of the week, but, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good list. Um, you've got several, several, uh, spring games across the, uh, across the country right now. Steve Wiltfong wrote up a piece and there's, there's a lot of spring games this weekend with Easter being last weekend. I think a lot of schools push theirs one week later and it's, uh, it's, it's very busy. We were talking to Lance Glenn about that earlier this week because he, he said last week they were building a, a national podcast and there was maybe four or five schools that had, obviously good visitor list. Now it's probably double that at least. So um, you know, it, it's a competition to get these guys on campus. Uh, Penn State doing a pretty good job and we'll continue online 24 seven to verify these guys that are coming and, and check out and, and hopefully that list expands. Yeah, head over to lines247.com. I know Brian Thones uh, been actively talking to some people. Sean, of course, has that list up. Um, plenty coming out of this as well as prospects talk about the experience, and we'll see if Penn State does expand its classes in the 2023 or 2024 cycles. Sean, getting it back to the practice field, we, we were there on Wednesday uh, once more, our final peak before this blue-white game, and we're going to talk about defenders in a moment because we focused on the offensive side of the football in the episode that dropped on Tuesday. But I got to get back to the fact that this persistent Nick Singleton buzz that has been, uh, you know, brewing since mid-January, it feels like. I mean, it is unavoidable where you've got Caden Wallace, uh, the way people are describing the things he is doing and the way they are pausing while they're describing those things. It's really difficult not to ignore. And I can't wait to see the kid in action on Saturday. I, I got a text last night. So these, these freshmen are good. <laughs> and through the text. So I, that was interpretation in my head. Um, but uh, Singleton and I, I think Allen's better than they expected, to be honest with you. I, you know, he was very productive at IMG. But when you're playing at IMG and you're playing around the, that kind of talent, I mean, it, I don't want to say it's, it's, it's hard not to look good, but that's everybody's your your best players 
are, are your, your average players are better than a lot of schools, best players. So, um, you know, that's, that's a situation that can make a running back look pretty good, but he's been strong. He's been, he's been running well, but yeah, Singleton, it, it's impossible to ignore. I had him as my number one guy to watch, um, on the offensive side of the ball. And yeah, he's coming, man. <laughs> he's, he's gonna, he's gonna get carries. He's gonna get touches. I would love to see, you know, if they put him back deep or something like that early in the season to maybe get him a little bit more comfortable with handling the ball and things like that. That'd be fantastic to, uh, to see, but uh, yeah, you're right. You can't ignore it. Um, hopefully he's got some holes to run through. Yeah. The other guy that, that we've been hearing more frequently about it. I feel like ever since we mentioned on the podcast at some point during spring ball that we hadn't been hearing much about him, everyone wants to tell us about Mitch Tinsley, uh, the, the Western Kentucky transfer coming in and, and we were now, uh, referred to as money making Mitch uh, by Jair Brown, who, who said he's really come in, been consistent, making splash plays. Um, and he's somebody that, again, we've seen working against the air for the most part or going through blocking drills or working uh, on, on ball security drills. So, again, this is a very talented group of cornerbacks and, and safeties lurking. I want to see Mitchell Tinsley go to work and, and, you know, whoever's throwing the ball to him, that'll be fun to watch too, of course, at the quarterback position, but uh, there's a lot to look at with this wide receiver group. I want to see who's out there to compete, maybe who gets put in their place a little bit by some of these defensive backs. And uh, I think it's going to be a really good vantage point just to get some perspective on a, a group that we have a lot to learn about beyond the top couple guys. Money making Mitch, huh? Yeah, there it is. All right. That takes me back to some Adam McLean days. Uh, a lot of Penn State fans will get that reference. So uh, hopefully Mitchell Tinsley has a uh, you know better finish to his career uh, than, than Mr. McLean. But uh, it was, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a situation where you've got a lot of, I think, talented bodies. Um, I don't think we'll see much of Parker Washington this weekend. We kind of glazed over him in the first episode. We've seen very limited uh, of him as a receiver. We've seen him back there returning punts. He seems healthy, fine, dandy, all that kind of stuff, but seems like a light spring for him. And by the way, I... I turned on by choice. I turned on the Penn State Rutgers cutups uh, from from November. Uh, I had a yeah. coach reach out about Anthony Wigan, and I was like, I think he played in this game. So I, I turned it on and I started watching it. Parker Washington's really good, man. Like you kind of forget how good he is. Of course, Jahan was his own guy, uh, but Parker Washington is going to be such a big part of this offense, and um, I'm, I'm excited to see where that uh, how that kind of takes off and and how that opens things up for Mitchell Tinsley because I think Tinsley is a guy like Parker that can work inside out. You could put a guy in motion. You know, you, you don't have to do as much in terms of changing formations and changing guys to which side of the field and all that stuff and, and, and make that work. It's kind of like we talked about with the tight ends last year. It gives you a lot of flexibility in your offense. And, and I think Tinsley can really make the most of it, not necessarily by coming in and being the number one guy because I think Washington's going to be a number one guy, but you can be a two or three guy and, and you can get your catches. He saw that last year. He was number two guy for Western Kentucky and still caught – 80 some passes. So uh, very excited to see his development. Um, curious to see how the veteran steady presence goes on one hand. And the other hand, you've got Malik Mega, you've got Trey Wallace, you've got these athletic, uh, raw, uh, freaky type athletes. And then all of a sudden you've got M Mitchell Tinsley on the other side. I'm curious to see which way that the, the arrow points in terms of who you're going to trust more, who you're going to go to more, and how much time will these younger guys get to to sort of explode under the scene? Yeah, does the speed show up for Saunders, Evans? Do we see some some uh, exploitation of, of the back end of the defense from those guys? Uh, something to watch for. And then two two players that I just haven't heard much for from this spring uh, in, in reference to that receiver room. Guys who are at year number two, year number three, Liam Clifford and Jaden Dotton. Can they do something to flash out there in the field? We, we just haven't seen it to this point. Uh, a little bit earlier right now for Liam than it is for, for Jaden. But two other names in that room with more guys on the way this summer that we're just trying to, to, to figure out what exactly uh, they can accomplish uh, on Saturday. Uh, we'll see you again. Quarterback, I don't want to go down the offensive path too far, but you know, I, I'd expect like we, we heard this last week or so has been lighten the load for Sean Clifford. Uh, there's been more work for the other quarterbacks. James Franklin said that he feels like uh, both Bo and Drew have, have handled more work this spring than they anticipated going into spring ball. That's a positive thing. Um, and, and you'd expect this, a guy with 33 career starts and, and a guy who has uh, doesn't really have much to gain, I think, from one additional practice and maybe one extra series of offense. I think we're going to see Clifford really communicating with the younger quarterbacks more than throwing the ball to receivers on Saturday. 
two things. Love to hear it because number one, that's exactly what we we had hoped had happened. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, you wanted to see those younger guys get more reps. Sean's been around here for a long, long time, and I know his his offensive coordinator situation has sort of ebbed and flowed throughout his career. But those younger guys need reps to to catch up to get that entire room where you want to get it. Number two, delighted to hear him admit it. Like this is usually a situation where you say, well, we split all the reps evenly. You got to four guys taking equal reps and all that stuff. I mean, he admitted, you know, you, they're, they're taking some weight off of Clifford and throwing it to the young guys. And to be honest with you, for, if you were playing a typical scrimmage on Saturday, get Clifford a couple of series and then throw those young guys out there and see what they've got. Because that's, uh, you know, no, no disrespect to, to the old guys. I know Clifford went on to uh, Adam Brenneman's podcast this week and talked a little bit about hearing all the fans wanting to see all the younger guys. Um, but the fans want to see all the younger guys. I mean, that's kind of what uh, spring ball is for. You brought in those guys. They're certainly talented. Both of those guys. Well, I know we kind of sell, uh, or excuse me, all three of those guys, we kind of sell Christian and Bo short because of the recruiting accolades. But uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a group that is much further along than it was at this time last year. I'm going to keep a close eye on body language with that quarterback group. There is a bigger crowd than, than Bo or Drew I've ever played in front of, even though it is a practice setting. Um, and I just want to see how they're dictating to their teammates, uh, how much maybe confusion that we see between their communication with Mike Yersich. And again, I think Sean Clifford is basically going to be kind of the, uh, the, the part of that equation where he's a few yards behind these quarterbacks on any given play. So just something to watch for as those guys try to orchestrate an offensive huddle. It's not just about throwing beautiful passes, hitting your receiver in stride. It's about getting the 10 other guys situated pre-snap and then executing against a defense that's in motion. So we're going to learn something about these quarterbacks. I think we've seen them take live reps, live snaps against a defense. Did we see any of that from Bo or Drew? I'm not sure uh, this spring. I don't think we did. So we we got a lot to gain from just seeing them go up against 11 defensive players. I think we saw we saw two plays this this spring. If I'm if and I'm I think it was Sean Clifford and Christian yeah. Veyu at quarterback, if I recall correctly. So, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're working with. <laughs> now, granted, it's it's been nice to, to catch up with sources and things like that. But yeah, it's uh, it, there's been a lot of we, we've got our Barney and more takes. I'm sure that's uh, that's what's going to keep this podcast rolling. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you've got that. Uh, Franklin talked a little bit last night about the offensive line. Uh, we addressed that beforehand. Getting those guys back, obviously key. Keeping those guys healthy, even more of a key. Uh, Franklin went on Big Ten Network uh, yesterday, I believe, and talked, you know, that's the number one priority is just staying healthy. And I think it starts there. It, it bleeds over to linebacker because you've got a situation where you're going to, you know, for, for as thin as offensive line is, you know, linebackers right there with them. And, and mm. you know, you don't need necessarily need to see as much out of some of the older guys, but Kobe King, Tyler Elston, those guys, and even John Sutherland in a new spot, it's going to get those scrimmage reps are going to be valuable. Yeah, we'll see what happens with those linebacker reps. And 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 we heard from Terry Smith last night talking about using you know five six defensive backs on the field and and really tapping into that cornerback room. And uh, it'll be fun to, to see some of that personnel and, and maybe if there's some some different mixing and matching uh, from from that standpoint as Manny Diaz tries to find his best eleven and then the next best eleven after that. Um, one other note there: one of the best guys on this defense has not been on the field this spring. He'll be back this summer. We fully anticipate that. PJ Mustafer, according to James Franklin, uh, ahead of schedule as he recovers from an injury suffered last October on the road at Iowa. It's great to hear. We know that PJ is doing his part as a heart and soul leader of this team uh, on the sideline in the film room, but to get him back in a three-point stance and attacking opposing offenses is what they want. Uh, They're taking a conservative approach, according to Franklin, but for him to be willing to go out on the record like that and say they feel like Mustafer is ahead of schedule, great to hear. Really great to hear. Can't wait to see PJ Mustafer on the field. Uh, can't wait to see uh, you know a situation where you you've got all your defensive tackles back. Uh, we we've seen a lot of Jordan Vandenberg this uh, this uh, this uh, excuse me this spring, um, and I'm actually probably jumping the gun for our, our five players to watch. But uh, you know with defensive tackle, it would be nice to see that entire room healthy. Well, let's jump right into it uh, because there are uh, oh, there's only one new defensive player, and we're going to hear about him in just a second. In terms of scholarship additions, there's a lot in coming in the summer. We've discussed that you've got a, a big presence coming in from the transfer portal in Robinson. But in terms of who's going to be on the field uh, on Saturday, who we anticipate to be there in Beaver Stadium, uh, competing five defensive players to watch. I'll get the first pick. You got Singleton on offense to start things off. I'll go with the other freshman that everyone wants to tell us about, Zane Durant. Uh, just, I mean, again, the adjectives we're hearing applied to this guy and the pauses we're hearing in the answers that are being given about Zane Durant's performance on the practice field gives you every, every indication that he came 
to campus and just immediately started obliterating offensive linemen uh, and and not just in a reckless physical uh, way, a guy who has really put it together, uh, been following PJ Muster around like a puppy dog, it sounds like. And really, once they got to the field in late March, he just hit it in stride. And by the time they finished this thing, and I've said every step of the way, it's one thing to hear about it in, in winter workouts. It's one thing to hear about it in the first week of spring camp. We are hearing things about Zane Durant in the final week here of spring camp that just gives you an indication that not only will he be a presence on the field for Penn State from September 1st on this fall, but this guy could rack up a significant amount of starts if he keeps doing what he's doing. Yeah, I would go snaps over starts at this point, but yeah, he could he right. could play quite a bit because I think he's he's versatile. You throw him in that five tech if you need to. Um, you know, you kind of play him in a role like Akeem Beeman. That's I'm excited to see. Uh, you know, why don't why don't I just go with Akeem Beeman? I mean, we haven't seen a ton of him. Uh, James Franklin kind of singled some guys out the other day, say they missed for for one reason or the other. But it seems like he's on the track, and seems like they're on the track to get where they need to be. Beeman, uh, an interior guy still. I feel like I have to clarify that every time it comes up because we talked so much about the deep, potential defensive end last year. Um, but, uh, you know, he's the same kind of guy as Durant. Uh, quick twitch on the inside. They'll have an opportunity the, the, this weekend playing against that offensive line to put up some numbers, to be impressive, and to, and to possibly get to the quarterback and and do some good things. And, uh, again, I keep going back to this defensive tackle room. It's It's deep. And there's a wide array of body types and athletes and things like that. And even without PJ Mustafer, and once they get PJ Mustafer back, obviously he's a starter. But even without that, you've got guys that started in Devon Ellis, uh, Kazai Izzard, who's dealing with an injury right now, so probably won't see him on Saturday. Uh, Jordan Vandenberg, who's moved up the the depth chart a lot. Zane Durant, Hakeem Beeman. I mean, there's, I mean, that's that's a that's a whole hand right there. Just uh, that's uh, that's where you like to be. And for as much hand wringing as we've done over the last couple of years about defensive tackle recruiting and having all those guys on scholarship, you're starting to see that cream rise and you're starting to see that sort of, uh, you know, the, the, that master plan, if you will, come to fruition because you've got other guys that are transferring that aren't playing and that's going to even itself out in a numbers perspective. And hopefully by that point, you get the, the best talent on the field uh, that you can get out of that group. I'll go with another guy that, that we didn't see in game action last year. Adiza Isaac uh, said it all the way this spring. It's just the positivity and the optimism about where he's at in his recovery process. Of course, his injury occurred well before the season last year, but you still never know. Um, sure feels like he's coming out of spring and uh, full steam ahead going into the summer in terms of him not just you know fulfilling his ascension to the starting lineup, but maybe being that kind of a game record edge rusher presence, uh, a guy who can be an all Big Ten caliber caliber defender for you um look it, it's it's a lot to load up on a guy's shoulders after missing an entire year of game action in football uh but the staff and his teammates and i'm sure adiza if we talk to him and maybe we'll get a chance to do that saturday they're not pushing pause they're not tapping the brakes here uh, so neither am i and i want to see what he looks like working against these offensive tackles uh is that explosiveness apparent um because it sounds like he hasn't missed a step and maybe he's gained one since he got back on the field i will say this I'm fine not seeing him this weekend. Like I, I think from it from an injury standpoint, That's a good from, point. from a re recovery standpoint, we can see a little bit of him this weekend. That'd be great. But you know, we, he has been in there in the full in the in the few scrimmage, uh, you know, reps that we've seen. He's been in there. Um, but it really would not bother me whatsoever if he did not play this weekend. Hey, you, you talk about putting a load on his shoulders. I'm more worried about that leg um, and getting that as healthy as possible for August. So I, I, I see where you're coming from, but I would. I, I would be pleased to see more of Smith Vilbert, more of uh, the younger guys that are out there at defensive end uh, to get them work. Because not that we know what Isaac is, um, we we know that we know what we thought Isaac could be, but he's better off being healthy, you know, fully healthy coming into uh, to August than he is, you know, playing a couple of series uh, in the spring game. I'm going to go I think, with Sean. I'm just going to say part of this for me is like taking a peek also at Olu Fashanu and Caden Wallace working against Adiza Isaac and, and what that matchup might look like. That's another thing that just mm -hmm. has kind of been off the table for us this spring, getting some, you know, give me five or six of those kind of reps that we can just take a long glance at. Then Adiza can go sit on the sideline all, all the rest of the day. That's okay. All I'd right. love to see a little bit of that. I'd be, I'd be very happy. Playing both sides. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to go with Zaki Wheatley. I watched him at practice Wednesday. And I, 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 you know, from talking to people, this is a guy that going, even going back to last fall, they, they told me Zaki Wheatley would play this year. Didn't quite believe them because he was at corner because he, you know, we had not seen anything from him. We've seen him in practice. 
um, did not play his senior year of high school, which is obviously out of his hands uh, with, with the COVID restrictions and things like that. But there was just something about him. He could always find the football. And that's what he did as a junior in high school. He's a really good receiver, really good player. Um, uh, and it was kind of just a complete mystery, man. And I'm really excited to see him. Watched him on Wednesday night. And the ball, just it, it, there are certain guys – and, you know, maybe I'm looking too much into this, but the ball just bounces their way. Like whether that's scooping something up off the turf or, you know, the ball last night, we saw him t- tip one in the air and his, his teammate uh, t- tipped it again and they came right back to him. I mean, the, the ball always seems to find Zaki Wheatley, um, not unlike it did last year with Jair Brown. So I'm um, excited to see how much he can cut into that, uh, that rep share there um, beside Brown or with Brown um, with uh, Keaton Ellis and Jalen Reed, um, two guys I'm also excited to see, but Wheatley just keeps popping up the guys, you guys, you, you talk to, um, you know, speed is the one knock for him, but he's got length. He, he covers a lot of ground, even if he's not a four five or four, four guy. Um, and then if you can find that football and be smooth and, and, and make those plays, that's how you find your way into the field. So, Really excited to get our first full look at Zaki Wheatley this weekend. It seems like if, if you ask, hey, who is who's really making their move out there in the spring? It's 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 one of those three. It's Nick Singleton, Zane Durant, Zaki Wheatley in some kind of order. And Wheatley, of course, uh, we, we heard from Terry Smith and Jair Brown last night leading the team in takeaways. Jair Brown, of course, uh, you know, uh, I think Terry Smith went so far as to call him uh, the best player on the team. Uh, and and they just, I mean, that is a, that's a big statement. He talked about him and PJ Mustafer being the heart and soul. Um, Jair Brown's not necessarily a great pick in this format, but when I hear things like that, I want to see what, what does that look like? I mean, is he going to go out and, 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 what I would imagine to be somewhat limited action uh, as a fifth year senior, is he going to go out there and, and do some things that just look like, he's going to follow in those all American footsteps of a guy like Jaquan Brisker. I, I thought he was undersold a bit in the big 10 voting last year. I think he was a third team pick by the media and, and, a, and an Oliver mentioned by the, by the coaching staff. This is a guy that, that building off of, of what he accomplished last year in the takeaways department and, and what we hear about him as being the facilitator of what they want to accomplish on the field from a peer standpoint, I, I'm curious because Manny Diaz, the communication, this is a test. This is a, a bit of a hurdle, hurdle for them to clear with some people in the stadium. So I think a guy that's going to be really important with that, at least early on out there, is going to be Jair Brown. And, and, and I think he's going to be really important for him going into Sunday to hold a lot of those younger players accountable for maybe what happens on the field and what doesn't happen on the field. It sounds like he's done a nice job of keeping guys in check and walking that fine line of being player friendly but also a bit of an enforcer in terms of what they expect and, and guys meeting the standard. Darn good football player. Um, this is where we'll go back to the shoulders. We'll see how much they lump on him on Saturday mm-hmm. when they could get reps for Jalen Reed, for Keaton Ellis, for Zaki Wheatley. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a very short outing for Mr. Brown. Um, but there's a, there's a lot on his shoulders this year because he's, you know, he's, he's no longer a secret. He's not a guy that you, um, you know, can can turn on the film and, and say, we're going away from Brisker, we're going away from Porter, whatever. Let's go with this guy. People know who he is now. So the, the expectations are a lot higher. We'll see what happens uh, for Jair Brown. But uh, as we mentioned before, we had him on the podcast. Uh, really, really happy for him. Because when you when you come from his background, you come from the story that he came from. It's really cool to see it, uh, see it all come together. Um, I, I'll move on. Uh, linebacker, obviously a talking point, a sticking point for us. Um, I, I think the middle linebacker position is going to be the most interesting. Uh, I'm excited to see both those guys. We didn't see Tyler Elston on Wednesday, so I'm going to go with Kobe King uh, right mm-hmm. now, a guy that uh, you know really came in mature, a lot to like, almost burned his red shirt last year. Um, guy can play. Um, it's just a matter of catching those middle linebackers up and seeing if they can uh, you know bridge that gap. Uh, Ellis Brooks. Uh, did have some shortcomings, but played an awful lot of football, was in the right position uh, an awful lot of time. So I will say that's that's tough to emulate. That's tough to replace. And to do it with two guys, two young guys that haven't played much, would be a very, very tough undertaking for Manny Diaz. For the sake of, of getting a look at this defense, I, I hope that we do see Tyler Elston back in action on Saturday. Who knows, coming off of his absence Wednesday. But yeah, Kobe King was where I was going to go next at linebacker. But I'll, I'll just move over a little bit. Curtis Jacobs, I mentioned watching the body language and, and, and kind of the communication interactions at quarterback closely. I think I want to watch Curtis Jacobs pretty closely as they're working through this defense. We've heard a couple things that have caught my attention early on in spring ball from James Franklin. He talked about how the leadership dynamic for 
for Curtis Jacobs, which is something that's been mentioned by a lot of people and something that he's going to need to take a step forward. Maybe it isn't a natural, innate part of, of, of his arsenal as a football player. Jesse Luketa has mentioned it. James Franklin has mentioned it. Brent Pry mentioned it toward the end of last year. Um, I think right now it, it sounds like the jury is still a little bit out and, and if he's going to be able to handle that. You've got a long road to September, uh, but Franklin said he's got to get up to speed with Manny Diaz's defense. Then he can start leading in that defense. Jair Brown went so far as to say he's been shaky at times in, in developing as a leader this spring. Uh, and that was something that he said on the record with us yesterday. So he put it out there a little bit. He did also say he feels like Curtis Jacobs is turning a corner and that by the time they get through preseason camp, he's going to be in the place they need him to be. But I think I'll be watching to see how is he digesting what he's getting from Manny Diaz? Are we seeing him communicating with his teammates? Does he look like he's on roller skates a little bit? Uh, little things like that are hard to pick up in a practice format. Um, but Curtis Jacobs, I think, for a lot of reasons, is a subject of attention coming out of spring ball because he feels like an X factor, a guy who could really take this defense towards another level or maybe prohibit it from reaching a, an optimal result. Yep. Yeah, I can't argue with any of that. Um, I'll, I'll move on just very quickly. Um, I, there's a couple of guys that I'm not sure how they fit into the equation, whether they're long-term starters, whether there's something, you know, that, that maybe not that uh, we've talked about Smith Vilbert before. How does he fit in, especially after Damian Robin get, Robinson get here? You move to the outside. Johnny Dixon is a guy, um, you know, he came in with, with some expectations because of how much he played at South Carolina, but the guys in front of him were better. Porter Castro fields were better. Kalen King, I think is, uh, you know, ahead of him right now. And of course, Porter's still there. Um, you know, is he a guy Penn State loves to play a bunch of corners? You mentioned Terry Smith playing four or five defense or five or six defensive backs. Um, is he a guy that can, you know, solidify that corner room, give you a top four, possibly top five with with Daquan Hardy? And I, I just I'm curious to see if, you know, he is a, a dynamic player, if, if he's just another guy. So um, I think that Johnny Dixon is is a very, you know, he's got a lot of talent. He's been in the right spots, at the right times at, at, you know, at, at certain times in practice when we've seen him. Um, but, uh, I'm just curious what, what his, uh, what his eventual role, what his eventual ceiling is. I'm going to stay at that position. This is my fifth guy I'm going to mention here. And I'll go Marquise Wilson because he did come up in that conversation on Wednesday night of, about being back at, at cornerback full time. And Terry Smith saying, hey, he still has that playmaking ability. We've talked about that, you and I, Sean, here on the show a bunch of times about how he flashed as a freshman, forced their forced their hand and, and said, hey, you got to burn my red shirt. I'm too valuable. I can make plays, make some splashes out here. Um, and it just you know, last year, the way that Terry Smith phrased it, and he didn't fault Marquise Wilson for this, but he said he never found a home on the field in 2021. And I think when you stack that on top of what was a lost year in a lot of ways for players in 2020, he now is in year four, and I just don't know what to make of Marquise Wilson. I'm really, you know, I think he's a guy that should get a, a lot of run at cornerback on Saturday. And, uh, you know, can he go out there and remind us of, of what he's capable of doing out there? Because um, the, the cornerback conversation, we haven't extended it as much to Marquise Wilson as certainly we would have thought a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, it's kind of the same thing as with Dixon, right? I mean, you've got a guy that has, you know, played a certain amount of football, whether it be here, whether it be Marquise Wilson as, as a freshman, but a, a long time ago, essentially, in, in the college football universe. So uh, be very interested to see how both these guys uh, fit. And if you can get a group of four or five and you can feel comfortable with them. I mean, I said it last week. You remember Jordan Smith was playing in the Big Ten title game. I mean, he was their fifth corner. So it's a spot where you certainly need guys to step up. And I'm very curious to see what the second line looks like. Uh, you know, if that is indeed the second line of corners, if uh, you know, cause that they set a high bar last year. I mean, those corners, I know the defense, you know, the, the team fizzled out at the end of the season, but it was not because of the cornerbacks. I mean, that, that was a really, really good group and uh, we'll see how these guys fit up or fit in and how they can, they can make it happen. Uh, my fifth guy, I mentioned him a couple times already, Jordan Vandenberg at defensive tackle. I think he's just, a, you know, you, you forget about him sometimes because of how his recruitment went. He just showed up, essentially worked out, got the offer, committed, enrolled the next week. Easy as that, cut and dry, just uh, just like that out of junior college. Um, but played a good bit uh, there at the end of the season, and I think he's going to play a good bit this year. And it's going to be interesting because you're no longer looking to see who can fill holes at defensive tackle. You're looking at a – legitimate competition between five or six guys. And and that's certainly where you want to be as a position. And I think he can work his way into it. Again, we, we haven't seen much of Izzard, no must for this spring. So opportunity is still there for, you know, as crowded as that position is, opportunity is still there 
for J Jordan Vandenberg. So excited to see what he can do. We'll do our uh, our, our walk on shout out here, Sebastian Costantini uh, at safety, a guy that uh, you know we've we've talked about before, the former kicker that moved to corner, then moved to safety, really athletic kid. Dom DeLuca at linebacker, really excited to see what he can bring to the table because he's in there repping in the in the two deep when we're there every Wednesday, and I'm excited to see. You know, he's a really really good high school player in Northeast Pennsylvania, so excited to see him. And then Jake Wilson uh, staying in Eastern Pennsylvania at defensive end. Defensive ends always seem to have an opportunity in the blue white game, whether it's uh, you know early late whatever i'm not sure if jake wilson is ready to crack that rotation but he's a he's a hard-working player that can get to the quarterback and it, it is really good really athletic kid for a walk-on when you consider that we're, we're seeing a transition to a new defensive coordinator and, and we're seeing a transition away from losing seven starters there is a ton to focus on on the defense side of the football and hopefully we get some fresh perspective on saturday over the course of work in beaver stadium uh, Sean, really quickly, we mentioned this uh, a lot in the first episode of the week, but Jamil Lyons out of Philadelphia uh, scheduled to announce his commitment on Friday. Uh, the crystal ball still pointing towards Penn State, um, expecting that one to reach the finish line in favor of the Nittany Lions still? Yeah, I'm still feeling that way. Um, you know, I think it'd be a good pickup for Penn State as they move in. And, you know, we've said that before that uh, Blue White Weekend rarely goes without a uh, commitment. And I think uh, Mr. Lyons can start it off on, on Friday afternoon. Uh, four-star edge rusher and then a notable name popping up in the transfer portal today brian doan has some vip intel up on lines 247.com about him but out of philadelphia as well uh, spent this past season at arizona state eric gentry uh, a linebacker landed on a lot of all-american freshman lists uh, it is a train wreck right now down there at arizona state they are bleeding talent here's another guy who hits the portal naturally the region lines up for penn state the need at the position lines up for penn state but there's a lot of suitors here. Yeah, it's going to be busy for Eric Gentry. He was a freshman All-American, uh, tumultuous situation there at Arizona State, um, you know, where I, I don't know why they're hanging on there, but that's an, that's another story. Uh, but Gentry is going to be very popular. Penn State's already reached out. I expect them to be interested. Um, I expect this one to uh, to be one of those new age free agency deals with uh, with NIL, and we'll see how that uh, that turns in a couple of weeks. Uh, that is it for uh, some some news out there in the recruiting trail and the transfer portal. Quick five-star mailbag question. We'll wrap it up here. Sean, uh, a good one. I think we have our answer here as well. Now that some have been on campus for a bit, what is your sense on the impact that this freshman class can make in 2022? What was the text you got? These freshmen are good. That, that probably applies to more than just the running back room. Well, it was specified that it was the running back. So we will, we'll, we'll say that, but I, you know, you have heard things, you mentioned Durant, you've mentioned, you know, denied Dennis Sutton, who's not on campus yet that he can play uh, right away. But uh, yeah, I think it's a situation where you can start to see, you know, some of that cream rise for the the freshman group. I think Nick Singleton, undoubtedly, um, you know, you got to be your number one impact freshman. Uh, Durant's been up there. You're going to see a lot of the quarterbacks this week, but I don't know, in terms of 2022, how they fit into the picture and 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 how that works with Clifford and and Bayou in front of them, um, but yeah, I think you're starting to see this. Very intrigued with the speed aspect of this class, where you've got uh, a guy like Amari Evans, who's been out there as a gunner, he's been a returner, he's you know taking receiver reps and things like that. As we said, there are situations where you can put a fast guy out on the field, maybe he doesn't know exactly as much as the, the guy that's a little bit older than him, but uh, you run in a straight line, catch the ball and outrun everybody else. You know, is it that simple? No, but can it be that simple? Maybe. Uh, but uh, I'm very, ex very excited to see what Amari Evans can do, what Caden Saunders can do quick and fast there. Um, so you've got uh, an infusion of speed there, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And you're still waiting for Tyler Johnson. You're still waiting for some of those other guys to get here. Uh, KJ Winston, really excited to see him. I don't think, you know, many of those guys that are coming in in May, June, whenever they may come in, are going to, you know, make a huge impact, except uh, maybe besides deny Dennis Sutton. Um, but you, 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 you like the talent that they were able to put together. You can see why some of those pieces are, are starting to fit. Yeah, when, when you factor in the guys that we think are pretty comfortably are going to get that green light coming out of spring ball, you already referenced them, and, and then factor in who they've got coming in, starting off that conversation with Denai Dennis Sutton, I'm just going to reference something really quickly to tag on to what you just uh, described. Terry Smith last night referencing those four defensive backs that they're bringing in, Makai Flowers, Cam Miller, uh, KJ Winston, Christian Driver. He says they feel like two or three of them will make an immediate impact. Now, that doesn't mean ascending into a two deep role, uh, but it means maybe being on that fringe of, of, of the conversation at that four game threshold. And maybe maybe something happens and you get active or maybe you 
are a valuable enough component on special teams, but it sounds like they see enough where safety and cornerback room could be impacted on the field this fall by that freshman class as well. So you're talking about quite a few positions where guys will either burn red shirt or give this staff a lot to think about. August is going to be proving ground territory for these guys coming to campus in May and June. Yeah, and, and you've got, uh, of course, Alex Paqueta, the the punter, is going to come in. He's yeah. going to compete right away. Um, and then I think uh, Abdul Carter is a really interesting one. Uh, right. To me, you, James Franklin talked about him as a potential Mike a couple of weeks ago, numbers being what they are. Again, I, I don't know that he's completely ready to handle everything that you're going to ask a middle linebacker to do. But physically, there's a lot going for Abdul Carter right now. So uh, I think these guys, you, you start to look at this 2022 class and you say, who who could, I don't want to say be Zaki Wheatley, but who could be the guy a year from now who maybe took a red shirt, who maybe um, is starting to ascend and get actual two deep reps, things like that. I look at Winston, look at Abdul Carter, um, guys, that come in, guys that are coming in late, maybe one of the offensive linemen, something like that. Uh, maybe Vega Ione is, is ready to go. Um, so yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens with that group in terms of red shirts. But yeah, I think for the most part, uh, keep the expectations low on immediate impacts because that's just kind of the way it goes every year. You've got uh, guys that are really, really good football players. And it takes a lot to break into a big 10 a, a you know, a, a top half of the big 10 uh, kind of roster like Penn state. So we'll see what happens there. And then of course you've got Nick Singleton who I think is going to be really good. Yeah. And then just a reminder there, you've got 16 members of this recruiting class that still aren't part of the roster and the defense, especially going to be really impacted. So we've talked about it. It's an incomplete roster, but what they have to show us, we'll get a chance to see on Saturday. Hopefully many of our listeners be out there in attendance as well. We plan on coming back to you on Sunday, early on Sunday, uh, with our kind of recaps and final thoughts on spring ball. We'll see what pops up on the recruiting trail over the course of the weekend as well. But on behalf of Sean and our producer, Lance Glenn, I'm Tyler Donahue. Thanks for listening to the Lions 24-7 podcast.